Hi, I'm doing a video. Do I look okay on there? <laughs> okay, uh, today we're going to learn about Riemann sums and the definite integral. That is, just to put it, you know, uh, what am I calling it? We're going to add up a bunch of rectangles. And then we're going to discover that if you add up an infinite number of rectangles, then it turns into an integral. And that's all an integral is. You just add up an infinite number of rectangles. And then we're going to get integrals as area and integrals as constant functions. And uh, we're beginning the process of you doing integration. Well, hey, let's go ahead and define what a Riemann sum is. OK. I guess this guy named Riemann thought it up. I don't know anything about them. A Riemann sum has the following form. The sum of n number of whatevers, in this case rectangle, is equal to the sum as k goes from 1 to n of f of c sub k times delta x sub k. Let me show you an actual graph of this before you start thinking that this uh, equation looks uncomfortably like the F word. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So imagine I've got this sort of thing. Okay, I've got some graph that starts here at A, all righty? And the graph goes, uh, uh, uh. And it ends there right at B, okay? So there's my graph. And I want to get the area under the graph. The area between the graph and the x-axis from here to here and from there to there. And so what I'm going to do is create a bunch of partitions. But on the previous homework assignment, all of our partitions had the same width. But, but in real life, our partitions don't have to have the same width. My, my first partition can look like this and my next partition could look like this, and my next partition could look like this, and my next one may be this wide, and then this guy is this wide, and then that guy is that wide. You know, I've made one, two, three, four, five, six, what is it, seven partitions of varying lengths. And then when you make a partition, Remember the whole LRAM, RRAM, MRAM thing? The big question is, okay, I know the width of my rectangle. How do I get the height of my rectangle? Well, the fact is, you don't have to just choose among the Y coordinate of the leftmost point, the Y coordinate of the rightmost point, or the Y coordinate of the midpoint of every partition. You can, you can choose any darn point you want. So I'm going to call this guy C sub 1 so that the height of this rectangle ends up being f of c sub 1, right? That's the height of that rectangle, f of c sub 1. And then here's my next partition. I'll call this x1 and x2, all righty. And uh, let me, I'll, I'll choose c sub 2 to be kind of towards the middle, OK? So here's you know, the height of neg the next rectangle the height being f of c sub 2, and so on. For every partition, I'll just choose some random point here. Let's, let's choose this guy to be c sub 3, OK? So that the height of this rectangle ends up being this. And let's choose this guy here to be c sub 4. So the height of this rectangle oops, is like this. And then I'll choose this guy to be c sub 5. And so the height of the rectangle is right there. I'll choose, uh, let's go over here, C sub 6. So the height of that rectangle will be right there. And then finally, C sub 7. And uh, the height of the rectangle is right there. OK. So you see, I've got you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 rectangles. And if I add them up, I'll get an approximation of what's under that black graph. And, and what I'm doing is a lot more complicated than what we did yesterday or the day before, because I'm not choosing the height of the rectangle to be LRAM, RRAM, or MRAM. I'm choosing it to be any darn thing I like. So are you OK that each one of those widths gets their own name? This guy will be delta x1, and this guy here will be delta x2, and so on, OK? 
And so uh, in this case, I've got seven rectangles. K goes from one to seven. I've got my seven C's, you know, my seven F of C's, my seven delta X's. And uh, there you go, I get my sum. And that's a Riemann sum. There it is. When you're adding up a bunch of rectangles, it gets a special name. It's called a Riemann sum. Tada. Any question or issue on that? Okay. Well, hey, let's keep going. So now I'm going to talk about a definite integral. I want the video people to know I just made it. I threw the pen into the trash from approximately, what do you think that is, like three meters? Yeah, approximately three meters away. I threw it into the trash. It was awesome. Okay, definite integral. We call the definite integral the area between the curve and the x-axis. Area between curve and x-axis. Okay. We call it integral because, you know, when you integrate things, you bring them together. So when we're integrating, we're essentially bringing together all these rectangles. I don't know. That's, I don't know if that's a good reason, but there it is. Area between curve and x-axis. And so this area gets a name. And what we do is we say, the, oh, here we go. I'm going to define something. Uh, just one second. I've got to look at my graph. Where is that? OK. Here. Let, this is like a lot of theory type stuff. So I don't know if, if it's going to go over your head. But let the absolute value of p be the largest delta x. Let the absolute value of p be the largest delta x. Then the definite integral ends up being the limit as the absolute value of p approaches 0 of the sum as k goes from 1 to n of f of c sub k delta x sub k. Okay, so we're, we're putting things together, okay? So here's the thing. Right now, which of these delta x's, which of these partitions looks like the biggest one? I think either delta x2 or delta x4, I don't know, one of those two. But, but if I'm going to let that go to zero, if the largest one's going to go to zero, then necessarily what's going to have to happen to the number of rectangles I'm going to use? Infinite amount. Yeah, infinite amount. I've got to use more and more. If I, want my, if I want my largest partition to be really, really teeny tiny, then I'm going to need lots and lots of partitions, right? I can't make this guy tiny without making other guys big unless I add more rectangles, okay? So this is just a way of saying, hey, I, I want an infinite number of rectangles, okay? And so we give this the name, this is the definite integral from A to B. And you're going to see me saying that more, OK? Well, here is, like, if I can number them, here's number one, here's number two. And now here comes number three, the third point I want to make, OK? What if all the delta x's are the same, which is what we were doing yesterday? If all the delta x's are the same, okay, then for n partitions, delta x is going to equal b minus a over n. That is, you know, we've done, don't write this on the board, but we've done this sort of thing where if this was 3 and this was 8, and I had some graph, and I said, okay, you know, I want uh, uh, five partitions, okay? What's the delta x going to be? 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, if I want five partitions, 
then the delta x is going to be b minus a over n, you know, the difference between the x values divided by the number of partitions, which ends up being 1, and, and you see that that actually happens here. You know what I mean? So that's it. So that's your delta x if you know what a and b and n are, okay? And so this area ends up becoming the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum as k equals 1 to n of f of c sub k times delta x. So now I don't have to make a distinction between who's the bigger and who's the smaller partitions, which we did for our Riemann sum. Now I'm saying, okay, all my delta x's are the same, so I can just say it's just delta x. And then instead of saying I want the smallest partition to go to zero, I'll just say, hey, I, I want an infinite number of partitions, okay? And so this brings us now to, yes? What is the green? This green, yeah. uh, delta x1, delta x2, that's showing you the, the width of each rectangle. So like this third rectangle, this, this width from there to there, I call it delta x sub 3. Yeah, and so that ends up being in this summation, f of c sub 1, f of c sub 1 times delta x plus uh, delta x1 plus f of c sub 2 times delta x2 plus f of c sub 3 times delta x3. That's adding up all the areas of the rectangle. Yeah, that's it. That's what it is. It's so funny because your homework tonight, you're going to be doing this sort of thing a lot. But uh, what we learn on subsequent days is going to end up being a lot more important. Well, now, hey, this brings us to Leibniz notation. Leibniz notation. I forget Leibniz's first name. It's like a really German name, like Wilhelm or Gottfried. Anyone <laughs> remember Leibniz's first name? <laughs> Gottfried Leibniz? Ah, uh, don't worry about it. It was not. What's that? Was it Gottfried? Yeah. Oh, good for you. Okay. Gottfried Newton. Well, does anyone know about the big controversy between Leibniz and Isaac Newton in the time when they were both alive? Uh, didn't they like both work on uh, something, but Newton got most of the credit for it? Yeah, and it was Angel, what Angel said is calculus. They both invented calculus. And supposedly, they both invented calculus simultaneously. Whereas Isaac Newton believed that he invented calculus and then Gottfried Leibniz stole it from him and claimed to invent it himself. So it's just, I mean, you know, Isaac Newton was, was indefatigable in his efforts to try to troll uh, uh, Gottfried Leibniz to, Leibniz to say he did not invent calculus. He devoted a lot of his life to that endeavor. But anyway, whether Leibniz invented calculus or not, we sure prefer his notation. And so we use Leibniz notation for, for uh, integrals. And so that here's what we do. We say the limit as n goes to infinity as k goes from 1 to n, uh, you know, of f of c sub k times delta x. Well, because my n is going to infinity, that means my delta x is going to 0. And just like we learned with derivatives, I just want to remind you that if I have the limit as uh, delta x approaches 0 of delta y over delta x, do you remember what do the deltas magically turn into? Yeah, they, thank you, Justin. They turn into d's. This becomes dy dx. Well, the same thing here. It's it happens here because that's all Leibniz. And so that delta x magically turns into a dx, OK? And then instead of f of c sub k, he just uses functional notation and calls it f of x. And then finally, instead of the limit as n approaches infinity of this summation, he uses a kind of a ornate way of saying a summation. He uses something that looks like an elongated S. And then finally, <clears throat> if someone presents this to you, then in another sentence, they've got to tell you where these rectangles are going from, in this case, from A to B. Well, Leibniz says, I, I don't want to have a summation where someone has to tell me additional information. I'd rather have a summation where that in additional information is given to me right there in the drawing. And so he says, OK, the lower bound, 
you know, the starting point of all my rectangles goes there and the ending point goes there. And that's how we're going to express areas. What this is called is it's called the integral of f of x dx from a to b. That's the word you use when you read that. That is the integral of f of x dx from a to b. Or you could say the integral from a to b of f of x dx. You can do it in either order. But you add, that's what you say, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, or the integral of f of x dx from a to b. That's the way you say it. So get used to it. The a, we call it the lower limit of integration, or the lower limit of the integral. We call b the upper limit. So if I tell you let 2 be the lower limit and 5 be the upper limit, that's what you put 2 on the bottom and 5 on the top. That elongated S is called the integral sign, or often called the integral symbol. That function f of x is the integrand, it's what you're integrating. So we can call it a function f of x, but it's called the integrand. And then finally, the dx tells you what you're integrating with respect to. That is, the dx tells you what variable you are integrating with respect to. So there it is. Why do I need to know what variable I'm integrating with respect to? Well, sometimes the integrand will have more than one type of letter in it. For example, if I have this, the integral of cx squared dx, that tells the world, hey, I'm integrating with respect to x, not with respect to c. And so you're going to find out later that when you take the integral, you're actually taking the antiderivative. So this ends up being 1 third cx to the third plus the constant of integration. Well, maybe I should, I'll just call this c1, plus the constant of integration. That's what you would get if it was dx. But if you had this cx squared dc, now it's telling you, hey, my x squared is constant. I'm taking the antiderivative with respect to c. And this ends up being 1 half c squared times x squared plus the constant of integration. And that's why even your graphing calculator, when you try to do antiderivatives on your graphing calculator, it'll all, always ask you, what are you taking the antiderivative with respect to? Because they need to know, hey, are you taking it with respect to that letter or that letter? If you're doing it with respect to X, you get one thing. Do it with respect to C, you get something else. And you'll see how this works later. But I just want you to know that's the, the, the purpose, the use of, of the DX. OK. Um, well, let's keep going. Hey, before I go on, any questions or issues? No. No. Because it's kind of like, believe it or not, this is all intro, essentially. I mean, this isn't anything you're actually going to be doing, per se. You're not going to do this. You're going to be asked to look at it and, and recognize it, but you're not going to actually do any of it. So like I said, this is all intro. So here, let me give you an example of the sort of thing they give you in the book, the sort of problem, okay? Here's example one. Suppose you've got a Riemann sum that looks like this. The limit is the magnitude of <coughs> the largest partition goes to zero times of the sum of k goes from one to n of five c sub k 
delta x sub k, okay, where p is any partition of the closed interval from 2 to 5, okay, right, as a definite integral in Leibniz notation And I really appreciate you guys hanging in there and going through this. This is not a very interesting lesson. Cool. Well, hey, let's go for it. First, I know that. I know it's got to have the integral symbol. I'd like everyone right now to think, what are the bounds of this integral going to be? How many people think in 2 to 5? Yeah, good for you guys. Two to five. That's where my partitions are going from, from two to five. And then what's my function? Ordinarily, this place is occupied by my function. What's the function in this case if every partition, the height is five times c sub k, and the width is just delta x? What's my function? Y equals what? <coughs> So essentially what it's telling you is as you go from 2 to 5, let's say here's my function, okay, then when I make my partition, whatever I choose as my C, the height of the rectangle is 5C. Whatever I choose, you know, here's my C2, then, then the, height, the height of this rectangle is 5 times C2. So what must be that function? If any x I choose, the height of the rectangle ends up being five times it. Two x. Five x. Oh. You okay with that? I don't know what else to do. I don't either. <laughs> yeah, you guys okay? That this is going to be five x. You know, it's telling me that the height of every rectangle is five times whatever the c I choose is. And so, uh, and then finally, uh, since this times delta x, this is going to be dx. Ta da. -da. And in fact, I could even get the value of this, couldn't I? Yeah. Now that I know what the function is y equals 5x, which is I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this will go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Okay. And essentially, I've got the function y equals 5x. Here's my function y equals, oops. Here's my function y equals 5x. But I only care about it from 2 to 5. And so this integral is asking me to get the area under the function from 2 to 5. And so I'm just going to get the area of that trapezoid. Yeah. It's going to be the average of the basis, 10 to 25. The, the average between 10 and 25 is 17.5. So 17.5 times the height of the trapezoid, which is 3. And so I get, yeah, 50, what's 52.5? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the value of that definite integral. And in fact, if you punched it in your calculator, if you did f n i n t like we did the other day, and you put 5x comma x comma 2 comma 5, then you would get 52.5. Hey, you guys ready to do another one? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Here. What if I gave you this? Yeah, I'm going to get rid of all of this. What if I gave you the limit as uh, n approaches infinity of the sum as k goes from 1 to n of 3c sub k squared delta x sub k? Or how about if I just have all the delta x's be the same? So I'll just do that, okay? 
over the interval from 1 to 3. I'd like you to please write this in Leibniz notation and then do the punchy punchy on your calculator and see what that value is. And I want to remind you again, you press math. If you have a TI-83, you press math and then 9, and then you put in the function. You put in what you're taking the derivative with respect to, which in this case is x. Now, if you've got a higher level calculator, like a 84 plus or an N aspire, then it ends up actually just making this for you. So you'll actually just plug in you know, the stuff. Just remember that that's going to be your function. That's going to be dx. But give it a try. Go ahead and get to what that is and then get the value. Hopefully by now everyone's gotten that it's, is it 3x squared? Yeah. You guys got 3x squared? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, dx. And then do it on your graphic calculator. What do you guys get? 26. 26? Cool. We're going to learn, you know, later, of course, the first fundamental theorem of calculus where you'll do it analytically. But for now, the calculator is good enough. Okay, good. I mean, like tonight's homework is just really a lot of this. Here, let me, let me ask you this question. What if I wanted the integral from negative 2 to 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared dx? You can do this with your calculator if you like, but I want to see if anyone can do it without a calculator. Like, what is this, the, what is this a graph of? Like, if I had y equals radical 4 minus x squared, what's that the graph of? What's that, Chris? Okay. Well, hey, let's go ahead and just square both sides. y squared equals 4 minus x squared, or x squared plus y squared equals 4. What is this thing? Oh, it's a circle. Yeah. But do you notice it's just the top half of a circle? Because yeah. your y's can only be positive. Yeah. So then what's the radius of the circle? Uh, two. Yeah. So go ahead and please get me uh, what that integral means now. What is the value of that integral? Knowing that it's a top half of a circle whose radius is 2. What did you guys get? 6.3. Okay, someone give it to me in terms of pi. Go ahead. Anyone get 2 pi? Yeah, because it's half of the circle. And you know a circle is pi r squared. So it would be pi times 2 squared, but it's only half of the circle. So you get 2 pi. So yeah, you were right with 6.28 or whatever, but, but actually 2 pi is better. And any question or problem on this? Okay, then hey, there's another thing I need to tell you. And then, you know what, I mean, we're, we're pretty much done. I mean, shoot. It was just a lot of theory about Riemann sums and Leibniz notation and uh, getting what, uh, how to express areas. Here. Remember when I showed you that graph that with the pink rectangles? And do you remember how, when I had that graph with the pink rectangles, some of the rectangles went above the x-axis and some of the rectangles went below the x-axis? 
What do you suppose is true about the areas of the rectangles below the x-axis? They're the same as the ones above. Well, they won't necessarily be the same. I mean, my function doesn't have to be symmetrical. You know, I mean, I can make a function that looks looks like this, where they're you know where it goes woo like that, and then obviously it's, you know they're not the same. But you tell me. What's going to be true about these rectangles? And I'll give you a hint, your heights are negative. negative. Yes, yeah, so they're going to be negative areas. Okay, negative areas. So let me ask you this question. Let's say I had a function, the sine of x. Okay, and I want to remind you the sine of x looks like this. You see, this is pi, and this is 2 pi. So it goes like this sort of thing. You guys okay that the y equals the sine of x looks like that? Yeah. Okay? I'd like everyone to please tell me, what's the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the sine, the sine of x? The integral from 0 to 2 pi of the sine of x, sine of x dx. From 0 to 2 pi, what's that integral going to be? And I do not want you to use your calculator. Well, if you want to use your calculator, it be my guess. But you'll discover something wonderful. So what are you guys getting? Zero. Right, how many people got zero? Okay, yay, everybody. And someone explain the words, why is it zero? Say again, Lord. Yeah, the areas cancel out. This positive area gets canceled out by that negative area and that area is zero. Okay, so, so I need you to know that. Um, so shoot, uh, I think, uh, I think that's, that's, is that all I want to do? Um, let me see, page 264, exploration number one. Okay, what is that? 264, exploration number one. Okay. <sighs> Sorry about that. Why did the Mr. Sheen of the past... Oh, 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 oh. What? How interesting. <coughs> Hey, what if I told you this? Or someone do this, please. What's the integral from 0 to pi of sine of x dx? What's that integral equal to? Just punchy, punchy. Two. You guys getting 2? Yay, 2. So let me ask you this. What's going to be the integral from pi to pi, to pi to 2 pi of sine of x dx? What's that going to be? Negative 2. You guys getting negative 2? Because it'll be that guy right there. Great. OK, uh, let me see another one. Uh, what do you suppose the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine of x dx? What do you suppose that's going to be? Here's pi over 2. How many people say 1? Okay, yay. You guys, good. Um, here, I'm going through this uh, happy little thing. Uh, ooh, this, is, this is the last one I'm going to do, or one of the last ones. What about the integral from 0 to pi of 2 plus the sine of x dx. 2 plus the sine of x. So now I'm not looking at this graph anymore. Okay, here's 1. Here's 2. I'm looking at this graph. Okay, and this is pi and this is 2 pi. So what do you suppose that integral is going to be? Four. Four? Yeah. How are you getting four? Well, because the, the integral of sine of x is just two, and you add two to that, you get four. Okay. From zero, oh, zero to pi. Oh, my bad. Yeah, you're right. Shoot, I wanted to go from zero to two pi. Shoot. Here, let's go to 0 to 2 pi. You know, what you did was right. I mean, I know, I, I could go back, but 
but, but it's kind of easier to understand. What, what's the integral from 0 to 2 pi going to get you? 8. Okay, you guys okay with that? But it's not 8. It's Because it's this rectangle, this rectangle from here to there, right? Because you're okay that the, the sine of x stuff cancels. This positive area cancels that negative area, so all you're left with is that guy, right? Or you could say this rectangle is the area because whatever you, you know, whatever you lose by not having this, you gain by having that extra. But that's not going to be 8. What's, what's it going to be? Not 6. Well, no. Be specific. What's, what's the height? What's the width? 4 pi. Four pi. Yeah, 4 pi. That's all. That's just what I want you to see. That this ends up equaling 4 pi. Right? You guys okay with that? So, so when we do the one, the first one I gave, which was from 0 to pi of 2 plus sine x dx, what would that answer be? Well, not 4. It's going to be this, this guy, this rectangle plus this guy. What's that? Pi plus 2. Pi plus 2? Great. But you know, it's not pi plus 2, because this rectangle has a height of 2 and a width of pi. You guys okay? It's 2 plus 2 pi. I mean, 2 pi plus 2. OK, so you get a chance to do problems like that tonight as well. You know, you're just going to have to use your noggin on them. You know, you're just adding areas. All righty. Well, I'm going to, any questions, Fatima? Why is it plus 2? Because I'm, I'm graphing the graph 2 plus 2x. And let me, let me graph it over here just a second. Okay. <coughs> got to go up one and down one and up one. Okay, so are you okay that when I'm asking for the area, let's say from 0 to 2 pi, I'm going to want all, all of this area, okay, from 0 to 2 pi, all of this area that I've made green. So if I just want from 0 to pi, I only want this area here, okay, and this area is the sum of two areas this rectangle plus that guy. And this guy we already learned had a value of 2. And this rectangle is a width of pi and a height of 2. So this rectangle has an area of 2 pi. Is that okay with you? So do you find, funny, but do you find being the videographer hurts your uh, ability to concentrate on the lesson? No, not really. I just thought and kind of confused. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. All right. I mean, because if it did, it wouldn't have mattered to me because you're like an A-plus student, so it would have been okay. Okay, so, hey, I'm done. Any questions or problems on this? No. Okay, then this is your homework due Tuesday, except I'm not going to, I may go over it, but I'm devoting Tuesday entirely to reviewing for the Chapter 4 test. I really want to see if I can get fewer than 12 Ds and Fs. You know, so I'm going to spend all day Tuesday just reviewing chapter four. So make sure you're awesome at those reviews, your offices. Yeah, turn that thing.